Today, I have the absolute honor of having this phenomenal panel. Today, I have Abdul Razak, I have Nadifa, and I have Hafsa. And joining us virtually is Mia Kotu. Please wave so we can see that you're with us. Fantastic. And today we are having, we are talking about a fantastic conversation. Does anyone know what we're talking about today? Of course. Today, <laughs> today is about Africa. But for more points, today we are talking about where is Africa? Where do we belong in the greater conversations? How do we take center stage? How do we proclaim agency? And to begin, I'm going to take my seat because I know I'm not, you're not here to see me and we're going to get the show on the road. So to begin, Hafsa, I'd like for you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hafsa, I'd like for you to just briefly introduce yourself for those who don't know you. We are not going to assume that everyone here knows you and briefly speak about your experiences, the work that you have done and why you write the way you do. Write the way I do? Okay, well, I've written one novel, so I'm just at the beginning of my writing career. Uh, my name is Hafsa Zayan. My novel is We Are All Birds of Uganda. Um, it's about the South Asian expulsion um, in 72 from Uganda by Idi Amin, um, and more generally just about the South Asian and uh, African experience. Um, I am myself mixed South Asian and African, but West African, so I'm part Nigerian. Um, and I decided to write that particular story because it was a story that despite being of mixed heritage myself, I hadn't actually heard of before I met my husband who is from that particular um, part of the world and, and that region. So I was really surprised that I hadn't heard it. I was born and raised in the UK. I've been mainly raised um, in, in the West. So I live partly in the States and, and partly in the United Kingdom. And I think probably as a result of, of that, um, it's not something that I was exposed to. I didn't have any friends from that area, or at least I thought I, I thought I didn't have any friends from that area. After I wrote the book, um, a lot of my friends came out and said, oh, actually, my, my dad's from Tanzania, or, oh, my uncle is from there. And, and it was just a shock to me. And to be honest, for them as well, it was, a, it, was, um, it was a learning curve and a learning experience for them because they then got to go and talk to their families about their histories. So my motivation for writing the book was um, you know, to educate myself, uh, to educate anyone else reading it, and also to uh, just you know, represent this part of uh, history that hasn't really been told. And it's obviously a major, major part of British history as well as African history. The two are un unfortunately um, inexorably in intertwined. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me and that's my book. Thank you so much. Um, um, Abdul Razak, um, you need no introduction. Um, <laughs> um, please tell us a little bit about yourself. And the importance of the work you do in taking up space and shaping the African narrative. My name is Abdul Razak Gurna, um, and it's great to be here. Um, I am uh, a novelist, and um, also for many years, until just recently, I was also an academic. For most of my um, working life, um, well, most of it, I was doing both things. I was both an academic as well as a novelist um, until just recently. This was always something I wanted. I mean, from the age of about 20 something, I thought what I'd really like to, uh, to do with my life is to, to do that, to, to teach literature at university and to write novels. And it was great that it was possible to do that. Um, what else can I tell you? It's, what, what were we talking about? Uh, I mean, in addition to talking about ourselves, are we just talking about ourselves for the time being? Yes, for the time being. But right. also perhaps maybe later we could explore, you know, the impact your work has had in shifting or, or just impacting the African narrative. Well, I mean, you probably are the best judge of that, but I'm happy to talk about it, yeah. So um, we'll now very quickly go to Nadifa. Yes, over to you, please. So I'm Nadifa Mohammed. I'm a novelist. Unlike Abdul Razak, I didn't have a particular desire to become a writer. Um, it's something that happened without me really thinking about it in a deep way. 
but it was always there behind the scenes, I think, behind the surface. So I've written three novels. Um, my thing t seems to be novels based on real life stories, experiences, um, usually with Somali protagonists. But yeah, I think that meeting point between history and fiction is, is what gets me excited. Fantastic, thank you so much. Mia, are you with us? Hello. Thank you and welcome. Please. Thank you, everybody. Thank yes. you for the invitation. Thank and you congratulations so much. For, this, for this festival. Uh, in Africa, we need so much this, uh, this uh, moments of being together. Thank you. So I, I should talk so about myself. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm Mozambican. I'm, I'm a poet and a, and a fictionist. Thank you. <laughs> well, clearly, um, African writers don't like speaking about themselves. So that's something you have to work on. Um, but let's just delve deep and go straight into the difficult conversations. And oftentimes we hear from African writers that for them to get published, they have to write with a European lens. And oftentimes the conversations have to be around poverty, corruption, and war. So it takes away from the everyday lived experiences from Africans because it tells the story in a very one-dimensional kind of way. How can we reclaim that narrative? And this goes to you, Hafsa. How can we, and of course this will go to everybody, but how can we ensure that we begin telling stories through an African lens? And is there anything like an African lens? My novel was published through an imprint of Penguin called Murky Books, which was an initiative created by Stormzy, the, the grime rapper. He wanted to um, kind of diversify. He, he went to the oldest, largest publishing house in, in the Western world, Penguin Random House, and wanted to create this new imprint um, which was going to bring these stories, these untold stories, to the forefront of, 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 of you know, what Penguin was doing. And um, initiatives like that, I do think, um, obviously, while some care has to be had with how they're carried out and, and, and the ways in which it's done, they do help. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, my novel was well received because it was very well uh, publicized by Penguin, no doubt, because of Stormzy. And your impeccable writing. Mainly so, Stormzy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Abdul Razak, do you think the world is ready for stories that are not centralized on our victimhood or on how, 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 how impoverished we are, you know? Is there room for hopeless romantics like myself? You know, are there, is there room for such stories? Yes, there is room for the, such stories. I think you mustn't be too pessimistic about this. Mm. Uh, the, it, depends, it depends on a number of things when you talk, when we, people speak about um, the market requires the production of certain kinds of mm -hmm. text or narratives. It depends which market you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the kind of, uh, uh, should we say, general best-selling, that kind of thing? Well, they require any kind of rubbish that entertains. Um, it doesn't have to be a particular place or a particular thing. <laughs> and if, if the view of uh, what uh, the present state of the rest of the world outside of uh, Europe and North America is that it's poverty-stricken, chaotic, authoritarian, etc. then fine, that's what they hope to get. But we don't all have to be driven by that vision, as it were. Nor are all publishers driven by that vision, nor are all readers driven by that vision in all parts of the world. So I don't think we have to be kind of like submitting to this, uh, really, this reductive notion that Everybody, everybody who reads is somehow expecting when they read about Africa or something African that it will be about all of those things that I've mentioned. There is another thing. There is another thing that we actually don't know about each other, about ourselves. So even to speak about an idea uh, of an African writing that will do something different from what is expected is already to be kind of defeated, it seems to me. What we have to do is to, to be able to tell about ourselves in ways that demonstrate uh, the, you know, the complexity and variety and difference, uh, primarily so that we understand 
and other people, of course, we're not just talking to each other, but that, so that we understand the, the very complex nature of what we call Africa in a kind of uh, brushing aside where we have to understand that this is a very, very complicated uh, community or communities. And the more we can show that, the more we can put aside this thing about um, you only need stories of poverty and so on. Mm. I don't think so. Forget about them. Mm. So take home is forget about them. But who are we forgetting about, though? Um, but you want just me to answer that? Yes, please. <laughs> we have to forget about those people who think they can offer expert on opinion yeah. on us. The reality, if you even to take a few minutes and do a little bit of exploration, mm -hmm. the reality is that there are a huge number of writers operating very successfully around the world. They don't have to be people who appear on the cover of Time magazine to have a readership. Mm -hmm. It don't have to be you know that kind of. But people are talking to each other and people are writing for each other to read about. And here we are. You're talking about discovering uh, about uh, the expulsion of South Asians from um, Uganda. It's not, and I don't mean this in any way critically, but it's not something that has not been written about by various people, but it's that we don't know each other's stories. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, just building on that, um, is Mia still with us? I'm not sure. Yes, um, I am. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Um, how do we begin to create spaces that are distinctly African? What are the steps that we need to take to begin shaping those spaces? I think we, we begin to, we have already begun to, to do this. Whenever we write a true story, uh, something that doesn't need to be authentic, in the, in the eyes of, of the others, or we don't, ne don't need to have a proof of, of any authenticity in, in terms of Africanity or, or ethnic uh, identity. Uh, whenever we, we, we just try to be a writer, um, to tell a story, and, and it's true for, for, for the author, we are, we are Africans because we don't need to show, we don't need to demonstrate or to make a statement of, of, about this. Thank you. And, and just Nandi for building on what Mia has said, um, how do you think, especially as a British Somali woman, you know, how do you create a distinctive space that reflects who you are and who those around you are? I don't know. It feels like the conversation is barking up the wrong tree. Okay. Um, people are doing all sorts of things, and it's, mm. I think there's a, there's a need for Western attention mm. that distorts everything. Because if I go to Hargeisa and someone's written in Somali, a long novel from the perspective of the HIV virus, mm -hmm. that's it's so beyond any um, question of what does a, a British reader think about that. It's not for them. It's, it's for a local um, readership, and that's, that's where it belongs. Um, I'm not, as, an, as a writer, actively trying to mark out space as a British Somali writer. Um, and if I was thinking of doing that, I wouldn't do that as a writer. I'd probably do that as a publisher or, or in some other space in the industry. Because as a writer, you know, it's the most underpaid, uh, most time-consuming, laborious activity. And it has to come from something deeper than wanting to prove to white people that Africans can be rich, that they can spend all of their time thinking about their pools or their, you know, <laughs> whatever it might be. Um, and I think it also undermines what the Western readers looking for. I don't think Western readers are desperate to read accounts of suffering. Um, in By the Sea, the protagonist is a refugee, an older man who's a refugee um, in Abdul Razak's novel, By the Sea. But he, that wasn't his life. He was a, a wealthy man for a long time, was a man with status. Um, and that was all unpicked by what happened in Zanzibar. So by telling one episode of his life, you're also telling all the other episodes of his life that go against that. Mahmoud Matan was a man who was cruelly executed for a murder he didn't commit. But that doesn't just make him a victim. He was a much more complicated man than that, and in some ways a privileged man. And all of that deserves attention. Thank you, thank you. Um, and just speaking about, because I love this thing. Thank you. And Mia, just building on that, because you are one of the most prolific Lucifer writers, and you are both, um, 
surprise, a white man, an African. And how is it that you're able to sort of sit in between both wells and shape conversations that are distinctly African, but also um, experience our humanity as a whole? Well, well, I don't, um, I don't know how to, I don't, don't know how to answer to your question because um, I think, I think, of my work as being a, a translator, a, a translator of different cultures, even inside Mozambique, because yeah. there's more than twenty-eight different languages and cultures, and 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 um, a lot of a, var a variety of religions in in, in my country, so. Um, what I do is to, to put in touch uh, all this that is inside me, that is uh, part European, part African. And um, I, I try to translate it, the orality that is uh, the, the mainstream of our culture into the written world. And this is, this is a translation also. This is so important as a translation from a language to the uh, other languages. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I, I'm working in between cultures and in between. But I think I've, no, I'm not doing this because I'm a, just a white person in Africa, but I, I think we are all doing the same. Yes, agreed. And because previously we've had conversations about the hindrance of a lot of Africans from across the continent reading work because of a lack of translation. And perhaps that could be one of the challenges that has led to, you know, a shrinking creative space when it comes to understanding what other countries are writing about and speaking about and their experiences. Is that perhaps a step we can take in the right direction, translating you know, literature across the continent and beginning having conversations that perhaps reflect who we are and will that perhaps be a step towards understanding who we are internally first? And that goes to you, Abdul Razak. Sure, that com makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I suspect that uh, the reason we don't have that is to do with exactly what you started with, to do with uh, both poverty, or at least lack of resources, and lack of, um, how to put it, lack of uh, intention, lack of uh, commitment mm -hmm. from the authorities, from the state, mm -hmm. Uh, to to make it possible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, this festival here. And I'm not sure because I haven't in investigated, but I imagine that quite a large proportion, if not all, of the funding that's making this possible is coming from other than the state. Uh, and that's what I mean, that there is no support being offered by the, by the authorities themselves to say this is something important for our society. This is mm. something important for our community. Mm. Let's put something into this. Mm. The reason there are not enough translations of, uh, of African works between different languages, even those so-called official languages of these states, is because there is no investment from the society itself and this is both in terms of putting money into publishing, mm. but also into generating some kind of atmosphere to say, this is important, mm. read. Mm. But I don't think it's there. So it's mm. not good saying why, not you're saying it, but it's not good saying that we need to translate more books. We need to have, who's gonna do it? Because it needs money mm. and it needs commitment. It, it, it needs commitment from those who can make the commitment and that's, moment, since the state owns everything in most African countries, it has to be the state, and they're not doing it. Mm. Oftentimes we hear, and again, this is to you, Nadifa, that African writers also should advocate for the space for the state to start, you know, investing in the literature world, but is that also an unfair expectation that we put on African writers? Here you are creating this amazing work, then you have to have the extra responsibility of advocating for this work to be read. Um, what would you say we need to do to aid or sort of leverage on the work that African writers are working on to ensure that it gets read by a wider audience and there's more participation? 
I don't know if I agree with the state. Um, in Somaliland, the book festival and things have had some support from the state, but it's been from outside of that. Okay. It's been in the civic space. Yeah. Um, and that's a good thing because mm. I think the state doesn't want to challenge. I don't think the state is a supporter of a free art space. Mm. You know, the, every state will have its own propaganda that it wants to use um, through the arts. Um, so I, I prefer to work outside of that. I, I completely understand though about, you know, the British have the British Council and they spend a lot of money on that soft power. Um, and even in the UK with all of its resources, literature is still a marginal space. <laughs> There's very few people are interested in literary fiction. Mm. Um, and you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink when there's so many other things to grab people's attention. So I'm, I'm kind of accustomed to it being um, a minority sport. But within that, it should, it sh there should be passion. There should be um, this, this desire for, you know, in, in African, in, a, in Somalia, Somaliland, why are we not reading Kenyan authors to understand that relationship a bit better or Ethiopian uh, writers, because I think outside of those interactions, all you have is the political, mm -hmm. and the political is often fueled with hate and mistrust and competition, mm -hmm. um, and some of that could be pulled away through the arts, mm -hmm. um, but I don't trust states to do that anymore. Sorry. Yes, please. I disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> This seems to me the state has a responsibility in certain areas. You, maybe you're thinking of the state as always being, um, having its own kind of like nasty agenda. I'm thinking about this, the state as having responsibility, for example, to make sure that, uh, uh, it, that group people are provided with uh, education, uh, provided with hospitals, provided with certain amenities that make for, as it were, mm -hmm. civil life. And it seems to me encouraging people to participate in cultural activities is also one of those necessities of life. Uh, and to be in the same way as you don't provide hospitals with a political agenda, of course you do if it's a corrupt state, which unfortunately many of our states are. But if you provide hospitals, it's because you're making sure that the health of your citizens is kept at a reasonable level. And I'm thinking of the state intervention in that way. That is, that it provides, it provides support for cultural activities because it's a necessity of civil life. Do you disagree with that? <laughs> in some ways. Okay. But I don't want to. I no, 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 please. To let everyone else. Please, speak. please, please. <laughs> we can badly that. Yes, just come on, let's let me can move on to the next one. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> when it comes yeah. to education, yes. Um, and even. Public health care can be politicized, who gets help when and, and how and why. That's always been political. Um, people were refused HIV treatment or public awareness campaigns on, on important things like that. Um, in Africa, there is a, a huge issue with very evangelical or hardline religious organizations dominating what can be said publicly, so the governments often don't want to interfere with that. So even in Britain, you know, we recently had Brexit and the government's festival of Brexit. The arts are ripe for exploitation in, pr in promoting political agendas. And I, I would prefer the state to just step away. Okay, you prefer that. I prefer them to participate. And, and even given that there, there is clearly some kind of uh, political stance to this and that, I prefer to for the, for the state to be participating and, well, and an argument to take place to say, okay, we'll take a chunk of that and you take a chunk of that, rather than do nothing. Mm. Do nothing about schools, do nothing about hospitals, Absolutely. do nothing about culture. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's right. So, um, interestingly enough, in, across the African continent, a lot of ministries, state ministries, have sports and culture all in one. Yeah. And, and and everything, gender <laughs> affirmative action, and, and in Kenya, perhaps evangelical ministry will join the, 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 the um, uh, it was a joke, it was a joke. Uh, um, and, and, and that just goes to show, you know, what the state actually thinks 
or, or, or wide places, um, culture and, and literature and just um, the creative industry. And that can be extremely harmful because for very many reasons, you know, um, historically um, the creative space has continued to shrink because it has been assumed that it has a negative impact on the way people think and express themselves. So perhaps there's, yes. In, I feel like I'm, I want Mia to talk as well. Yes. Um, and Hafsa. And Hafsa. But, but yes, and I think in Somalia, the, the dictatorship, Siad Bale's dictatorship, um, fostered this flowering of the arts. Alleged dictatorship. It's not alleged. <laughs> yeah. It was very much a dictatorship. Um, but yes, they promoted the arts, music, uh, poetry, um, literacy in the, in the late 70s. But as time went on, all of mm. it became, you became a mouthpiece for the government. And if you weren't, you were arrested, locked mm. up, all the rest of it. And even now, in Somaliland, 30 years later, mm. you, the writer is still expected to be or perceived to be mm. the mouthpiece of politics. Mm. Um, I often get accused of being, of kind of promoting a Western agenda or um, maybe speaking for my clan or something like this. That mm. suspicion is deep. Um, and I can't see how that could be helped with more governmental interference. Mm. Okay. I'm now going to move away from the conversation around government. Um, we could have that conversation later on. And you touched on the fact that we're not reading each other. Um, Kenyans are not reading work developed in Somaliland or Somali, Tanzania, ETC. Why do you think that is? And number two, I'm going to ask Hafsa the next question as you answer the why. What can we do to bridge that gap? A lack of publishing, um, a lack of translation even though there are many people who could translate between Somali, Swahili, Amharic, yeah. all the way around. You know, people speak lots of languages yeah. within Africa. But the p publishing companies um, work, I think, to either publish people in, the, in their mm -hmm. first language or maybe translate mm -hmm. American, British writers, especially academic works, mm -hmm. religious works. Those seem to make up the majority of the market that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, so may, I don't know, like the, again, this, this does go down to, come down to people's expectations. Mm. You know, should I be reading a Kenyan author as someone living in Mogadishu mm. or um, vice versa, reading someone um, from Baidoa while living in, in Nairobi? Yes, I think it's really crucial. I think it would help people's uh, lives in many ways. But where do, you, where do you go? Where do you find each other? Mm. And that's true in, in, of Africa in many ways. You know, the, the flights are difficult in between countries. Everything is made difficult mm. between countries. Mm. Well, first of all, like, this is a pretty great start, I think. I mean, we've all been introduced to um, writers from other jurisdictions in Africa, mm. and, and, and we've, you know, learned about the, you know, books that I've not heard of, and I'm sure all, the, all of the authors probably didn't know each other's mm. works or had read all of each other's works, especially the ones that have been translated. But I don't want to wade into the debate between the heavyweights, um, but potentially, potentially... So I'm just going to stop you there. <laughs> yeah. You're also a heavyweight. Oh. <laughs> so we're, we're, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah. I just... Um, I, 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 you know, the, the translation issue is a publishing issue and a rights issue. Mm. Um, and they translate, work gets translated and published in other languages because there's a market for it, because there's an interest in it, because people want to read it. Mm. So how do we get people interested in reading, you know, or, you know, and you know, this kind of comes back a little bit to what are we encouraged to be mm. actively participating in? What, what's prioritized as part of our lives and I, and I don't want to say this, but to what role does the state have, you know, what role does the state have in, in, in that sense? And I think that might have been what Abdul Razak was getting at when he was saying that, that there is a role for the state to play in encouraging us to participate in these creative spaces, not necessarily to be in the creative spaces, um, but to, to encourage us as a society to be interested about each other and to uh, want to learn about what each other is doing. So, um, yeah, I think the, the problem is probably demand. I, I don't really know how you resolve um, that because as much as as much as there are translators mm. available and, and out there and ready and willing to do it um, They're not going to be translated if there's no no market for it. Yeah um, Speaking of translation Mia your work has been translated in over 30 languages Has that improved readership across the continent and the hunger for more of your work? Yes, I don't think the language is the, the, uh, the, 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 the worst uh, the, the main the, the most important difficulty 
I think um, and trying to to come back to the the, the lat latest issue we we're talking about, I think one of the uh, the issues is that we think about ourselves as belonging to um, colonial language communities. Let's say the Francophones, the Anglophones, the the Lusophones, and we in Mozambique we we organize a lot of initiatives of the Lusophone world, the like so-called Lusophone world. But we are surrounded by English-speaking countries. I'm, I'm always referring the official language, of course. Um, and we never thought of organizing something between us um, and uh, uh, and our neighbors. So it's something that we have assumed. Um, and part, part of the difficulties inside us, we're not connecting because we don't have this uh, urgency, this desire, and, and it's, 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 that's why it's so important to have a festival like you, you, you're doing now. And this is both for you, Abdul Razak and Mia. I think another thing that we haven't explored is perhaps the intergenerational divide. Uh, do you find that you are attracting or engaging with a younger audience more, or because even when we talk about distinctive African you know, identities, um, what a 21-year-old will identify with is not the same as a 60-year, not that you're 60, I'm just an example, a 60-year-old man you know, will identify with. You know. How do we ensure that we are speaking across um, you know, the, the age divide, but also ensuring that there are similarities that we're drawing? She's flattering me. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know how you judge that exactly, mm -hmm. uh, but if it's by impression, then uh, actually I find that the young people are generally quite excited about the, uh, the books, that they, the way they speak, mm -hmm. the, they study them, mm -hmm. and they're excited because they're studying them or discovering them. Mm -hmm. Uh, they seem very energetic about that. Uh, and of course, it's always wonderful, one of the wonderful things about festivals is that you meet readers, which generally speaking you don't. Um, of course, there is email, that only very few people are, um, uh, um, well, brave enough to send an email to somebody they don't know. I never do, I don't know how many of you do. But yeah, one of the things about festivals is you meet people, and my impression, if that's anything to go by, is that it's nothing to do with age. Mm. Great. Um, Hafsa, do you agree that just, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't think that the age or the generation is necessarily reflected in the writing, or if it is reflected in the writing, it's not necessarily something that the younger generation just aren't interested in knowing anything about or don't want to engage with um, because it's of a different generation. I mean, to the contrary, at least, you know, in, in England where I've grown up, there's now this kind of renewed interest in learning about our histories and, and, and reading from, you know, generations back. Um, and again, that's, again, something that my story talks about. One of the major themes is this kind of inter intergenerational divides. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there, there's much of a difference if a, a good book is a good book. Mm. Um, and it doesn't matter by whom or which generation it was written. Mm. Um, I think everyone can still engage with it. Mm. And do you think that younger people are engaging more or is, is there a decline in, in, and again, also to you Nadifa, you can chime in. You know, do you think there's a decline in, 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 in readership and engagement from the younger generation or is that also a negative narrative? It is slightly pessimistic, although it obviously has some truth because the younger generation has access to things that we didn't have access to when we used to read books. Um, but I think it's also potentially slightly false. I mean, the statistics that I've heard at least are that readership isn't really declining. Um, and definitely part of the outcome of the pandemic was that people were reading more. And I think that's not kind of declined since things have opened up again. So I'm not, I'm not sure what truth there is in it, to what extent it's completely accurate. But I'd always been under the impression that people don't read as much. I think people do still read. 
um, you know, our, our generation, like the young generation, they do still read. They read in different forms. They read on Kindles, they read on their um, iPads, they read on their phones. Um, but it doesn't mean that they don't still read literature um, and they're not still interested in it. And like I said, I think there's been a kind of a wave or a trend of people wanting to get back into reading again um, during and, and post-COVID. But that's just my impression. I don't know, Ladifa, do you think differently? It's difficult to say when it comes to reading, but I think there is generational shift happening when it comes to writing. I was teaching creative writing this year in NYU and also in the UK as well. And I think there is a difference in how we think. Um, the, there are certain norms setting in um, for, for good reasons um, to do with writing what you know and not branching too far away from what you know in case it becomes problematic. Um, and that can also affect the way that things are read sometimes because, um, you know, lots of the writing of the past, really classical works such as The Lonely Londoners, say, uh, by Sam Salvon, um, can be read in quite a misogynistic way. But I still gain a lot from reading a book like that. But it can, for some people, just a, a simple no. I'm not interested. It's misogynistic. I'm not interested. Um, and I think that politics is now expected at the top, the top line. So you set your cards up quickly. What are your politics? And then tell me the story after. Well, there's a real conversation, I guess, to be had about the extent to which people are now interested in who is writing the novel, mm -hmm. as opposed to what they're actually reading. I mean, we've seen this with so many authors who've come out with all their views and, and then they've had their works completely trashed or people aren't interested in reading them anymore, even if we would have thought they were quite good books. If they have particular views on particular subjects, we're not interested in their books anymore. So, I don't know, it, it kind of, it's a little scary. It is, and I, I can't say I've noticed it as deeply when it comes to African writing, whatever that is. So, there's less of this con condemnation mm -hmm. to a degree. There is some of it still there. Um, so someone's comments in, in, in a, in a, at an event, just say, can then be superimposed onto their work, so then their work also becomes forbidden. And that's, that's happened, um, I think, in African literature. But generationally, I think people are still reading everything because there's still a shortage. I think we don't have this massive body of literature to be able to exclude huge sections of it. We still have to take the bulk along with us. Can I? Yes, please. Well, there are two things I would just like to add to what has yeah. been observed. One is uh, when people say, is there, uh, are people reading less uh, as a result of, let's say, all this technology that we now have, uh, iPhone and so on? The assumption is that everybody was reading before. <laughs> But, but now, instead of reading, they're doing stuff on their iPhones. Well, I don't think that is so. At least, I mean, again, I don't have statistics. But I don't think that is probably so. so. And I would imagine that people who are readers have remained readers. Certainly, all, the, all that we know about book sales in whatever form uh, implies that, that readers are still there. They're still buying in great numbers. That's the first one. The second one. Uh, which is the way in which you've uh, just remarked on that half said the, the way in which somebody is offering an opinion, a writer that is offering an opinion on something, and then they become, uh, what's the word? Cancelled. Cancelled, <laughs> or trolled, or whatever, all of these things. Now, I don't know who does this. <laughs> Tenants on Twitter can give and, you a rough idea. And I don't actually know if it really matters who does this. Uh, for example, um, there are people who do these things for fun. Um, like when, uh, if I may bring this uh, lovely award that was uh, given to me some months ago into this, when a month or so after that was announced, or in fact perhaps even less than a month, uh, something went out on Twitter to say Abdul Razak Gurna has died. And somebody actually read this and wrote uh, uh, an email Im immediately to Denise, to my wife, to say, oh, I'm so sorry, it's terrible, you must be feeling awful, or whatever, you know? And, and other people probably believe this as well. 
And it turns out, did you read it as well? <laughs> no, no, and it wasn't me. It wasn't <laughs> me. <laughs> and it turned, out, it turned out that there is somebody who does this every year to whoever it is that has been awarded the, the, the Nobel Prize, yeah. he, he sends out a Twitter to say so-and-so has died. <laughs> Just you, for you, fun. You don't realize you had an impersonator. Abdul Razak Gurna mm -hmm. suddenly joined Twitter the day after. And I, I followed you, everyone followed you, <laughs> thinking, oh wow, he's finally joined Twitter. But it was, this, it was another person who always impersonates writers. Well, okay, yeah. there you are. So, I mean, I don't know how much of that really, in the end, uh, involves us ordinary readers, if you like. Mm. So I'm not sure if it's something I really would stay awake at night worrying about. Well, maybe that's the difference between your generation and my generation. <laughs> because <laughs> certainly, I mean, not, not something so, such as, so obviously untrue as X person has died, but these days, you know, social media is so pervasive and it gets into every aspect of my generation's life. If you have somebody say something about you on social media that is, you know, widely perceived by the rest of the community as like a bad thing, you are done. You are just completely done. And it, it, maybe you don't notice because you're not active on social media or you're not... You're involved. not on social media. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That means I can't reason. be cancelled. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe can. that's the solution. We you all can. get on social media. <laughs> you can. In, in absentia, you could be still cancelled. And I think it's, it's a very real threat. Yeah. You know, your, your publishing deal could be cancelled. Your, your, your book could be withdrawn. Yeah. You could lose your yeah. job. Um, and you don't have to be on social media for it to happen. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> Maybe we all have Abdul Razak's I attitude towards been. being cancelled. Um, just one final question before we open the floor to the audience. And this is around the lens that the, the, dias that the diaspora views African stories with, or African lives. And often it's fairly romanticized, you know, returning to the motherland, you know, uh, what the motherland looks and feels like. And where can we meet in the middle where, again, just around Black Panther, and I just last night watched Woman King, and, you know, the accents were horrendous. And in my head, I'm like, you can't be in Benin and still get it wrong, you know. Um, how do we ensure that we are still honoring African lives, even though there's an aspiration to be part of this beautiful community and continent, and, and, and not fictionalize us too much to the point where you erase our everyday experiences? Is there space, space for both to exist? And this goes to you, Nadifa, then um, I'll... Um, yes, there should be space for both to exist. I think writing from the UK, as I am, I'm conscious of the fact that I don't live in Africa, I don't live in Somalia, I don't live in Somaliland. Um, so there's an extraction happening. And politically, economically, that can feel off, that can feel wrong. Um, but at the same time, you know, the stories I've been telling are connected, the first two were connected to my own family. So how can I not have an entitlement to that? Um, and with my father's story, it was hard, it was a hard life, it was a hard story. and. My gut instinct was to kind of minimize some of the hardship because I didn't want to think about it. But he kept saying, no, 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 I was poorer than that. I was hungrier than that. Make it more, make it more. Um, and not have this shame because I think there is this shame. Um, there's often, you know, on Twitter and various places, there could be an outrage when Africa's presented one way or another, sometimes very rightfully, such as when there were the attacks in Kenya and the dead bodies were splashed on the New York Times. Um, but other times it's, well, this is the reality. There, there has been a suicide bomb in, in Mogadishu. And yes, there are other things happening, but let's not pretend this isn't happening either. And that push and pull between presenting a new face, a different face, a happier face, a positive face, versus the reality that's also there and is deeply important to the person who's just been blown up and their family and you know the people injured in that in that accident in that out, outrage but um yeah I, I understand i understand both sides i understand the desire to run away from the trauma but i think for me individual as a person i prefer to look at it examine it be with it see what it means look at each individual story as deeply as possible 
Thank you very much. That's a great note to sort of open the floor to our audience. Um, I'm going to begin by taking three questions. Um, oh, that was quick. Good afternoon. My name is Radha Upadhyaya. Um, I'm a lecturer at the University of Nairobi and I'm an economist, but uh, really interested and very excited to be here. I found the um, conversation on this literature as necessity of life and the debate really interesting. Uh, I think I want to expand the question to ask, how can you make it broader, broader than the state? I struggled a few years ago to, ex to try get a foundation that gives millions of shillings in textbooks every year to Kenyan schools to say, please, can you just join the Kwani books? It won't add to your total cost. Um, but it was almost like, no, no, we don't go there. We are just providing textbooks. So how can we kind of... Uh, make a broader appreciation of how literature is like a necessity f for civil life among others in civil society, not just the state. Okay. Thank you. Oh, should I? Yeah. Hi. Um, well, thanks a lot uh, for, for everything. It was very interesting. My name is Lucia, and I'm a journalist, and I say this because um, it really left me thinking a lot uh, what Hafsa said, our job is to write the stories because we also write stories. And, but I was wondering how, how is it like we write stories and then it, it, um, it belongs to the people and it becomes history somehow, no? Like in some years they will read the newspapers and they will think about the past based on how we wrote about it. But you also write stories. Uh, you write fiction, but still those are stories. And I was wondering how, how our job and your job is different and what can we learn from you as journalists? Like maybe we have less space for complexity and for nuance. And yeah, I'm wondering what are your thoughts from the four of you uh, about that? From the four of them? Wow, okay, great. I okay, mean, or so, yeah, whoever wants to talk. Yeah, about so, um, okay. yes, please, we'll take one more question and then we'll come back to you in the next one, I promise. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. My name is Lucy, I run book clubs. And my question is to Abdul Razak. Your book, Paradise, divided the book club in a very interesting way. One group um, didn't, not that, was traumatized by the book because this poor child was going through trauma after trauma after trauma. While the other side of the book club loved it and read it twice, finished reading it and reread it again. So my question really is to the traumatized group, is for the traumatized group, where there was no light. Was this intentional or, you know, because at the end of the book, the boy just runs off and goes off, but all we saw was just one long night of savagery that they were going through. Thank you, it sounds like your book club needs some therapy. <laughs> Um, so, we're going to start with Mia, you know, Mia, hi, um, the first question, especially around how can we ensure that others are involved, civil society, that literature um, takes up the necessary space in society, how can we create that space and what conversations need to start taking place? Can I choose the second one I mean, the, about journalism and literature? <laughs> because I think I'm more at easy talking about this because I, I was, I've, I've been a journalist during more than 10 years. And, and uh, for me, journalism was really an important school. And uh, I learned more than writing to someone. This perception of uh, the presence of um, someone uh, on the other side of the page, that is really, really, really important. So, um, then to become a writer, I, I, uh, I felt you know, the obligation of killing the, the, um, killing the, 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 the master, which was uh, the journalism. So, uh, I mean, in, in the case of Mozambique, journalism was so linked with uh, producing not just stories, but uh, the history, because the main part, most part of the academicians and, and the writers, they come from the, the journalism. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Mia. And perhaps, Nadifa, you could touch on, because you are very anti-state, you know, so <laughs> how could we ensure that we are engaging the civil society? What ingredients need to be in, in place for this to take? Um, I don't know. I really don't know. And I, I wouldn't say I'm anti-state, um, but I've become, I feel as if the, most, the, the more you can do outside of the state, the better. 
because um, the direction that many states are going in is not a healthy one. It's not for our benefit as, a, as an electorate or, you know, in many places, you're not even the electorate, you're just the body of people in that country. So um, I, I don't feel I can answer that, but I, to, you know, if, if I wouldn't have written The Fortune Men if it wasn't for a journalist writing up an account of Mahmoud Matan's life. And I depend, every time I read a newspaper, there's a hundred novel ideas there that you could walk away with. Um, so that, that basic storytelling, um, sometimes not very basic, sometimes you, there are these incredible long reads that work just as well um, as novels do in, in understanding someone and their situation and their own um, dynamic, their own j journey. So I think that journalism feeds back and forth into fiction. <laughs> um, there are newspapers that that create our circumstances by writing fictions. In the, in the UK, newspapers have a huge power, um, a political power, because they can take an MP's life and th get them thrown out of parliament, or um, you know, they'll turn a, a good policy that's trying to help people into something dirty that's, that's um, abusing the, the rich at the, at the, you know, for the expense of for the poor. So there's a lot of power in journalism that maybe isn't as obvious in fiction. Fiction is a softer, quieter thing, I think. Hafsa, maybe you'd like to add on to, you know, what journalists can learn from storytellers? Thank God you didn't ask me the civil society question. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to do question two. Um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, uh, I think what the question was really, um, what's the difference between our jobs, between what you do and what we do? And I agree with what Nadifa said, um, but also I think, you know, there's a question as to what kind of responsibility do writers have that journalists have or don't have, and, and vice versa. And you know, when you write fiction, leave, leaving aside nonfiction, but when you write fiction, every, every, every story that you write, people who read it take away something different from it. So it's like a hundred different stories or a thousand different stories. It's, it's as many stories as you have readers. Um, there's not one single narrative with a work of fiction. Um, whereas with journalism, you know, people are reading it and assuming that it's correct and accurate and factual and, you know, you have this responsibility to do your due diligence and you do have that to some extent in writing fiction, especially if you're writing about past events like Nadifa or, or I or even Abdul Razak, but you, you, you know, you have some liberty to play with the truth and journalists shouldn't have that really because the, 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 the population that's consuming you know, media, um, newspapers, uh, they, they think what they're reading is, is, has been researched and is thorough and, and, and should be accurate. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think there's probably a, a slight difference between what we do in that, in that respect. Thank you. Um, at African or Filter, we say, if you're not going to write a new one story, don't write it. Because oftentimes we find that when stories about other countries, especially with in the global north are written, there's room for nuance and complexity. But oftentimes that is foregone when you're writing about African lives. So perhaps we could take a bit more time when we are writing about us and telling our stories um, and engage more with the people whose stories you're actually telling. Um, Abdul Razak, you have the fortune of answering both questions. The first on civil society and the second one, you need to help Lucy's group, man. They, 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 they need help. In relation to that civil society question, <clears throat> or rather in relation to what I was suggesting, uh, <clears throat> that it was necessary, I think, for, for the state to be involved in encouraging and in promoting uh, culture. Um, what I mean by that, and <clears throat> this is why it's not exactly as you were reading it, what I mean by that is not so much that the state steps in and gives money to particular bodies, but it might be to, to, create, uh, to, to create a body, for example, that does this in a relatively um, self-interested way, that is to say, interested in its activities rather than in promoting uh, the agenda of the government. Of course, this is not always entirely possible, but to the extent that it is possible. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the ways in which um, the state or any kind of uh, body with lots of money, one of the ways in which, in which it can uh, promote culture is, for example, here's one, or 
another way of allowing people to know about other writings from other places is, for example, a book fair, or, for example, uh, giving money to uh, publishers, certain donations or something like that, which might be on the basis of we are, which happens in many countries, we are wanting to translate a book by a Somali writer, Nadifa Mohammed, but we can only raise 10,000 pounds and we need 25,000 pounds. Here's a body you can apply for funding to, for a specific project, that kind of thing. I don't mean that it sort of uh, does parades and flags and whatever, but to be sensitive to the needs of these cultural communities in whichever way it is possible to do so without interfering in what they do. This is what I have in mind. And I think it's possible to do that without completely possessing these bodies and instructing these bodies in a big way. And, and if we can't do it to ourselves, then we can't go on, we just have to go on moaning and saying books are not translated. There is no way in uh, economies that are so, like Tanzania say, quite, not quite so perhaps in Kenya, not quite so perhaps in other places, but in a country like Tanzania, everything belongs to the state. And if the state does not intervene, the education system, the hospitals, and all sorts of other necessities of civil life decline, as indeed they have. So that's what I meant to say. I'm not advocating state interference, but rather state responsibility. A uh, question of your uh, <laughs> reading group. Well, of course, I'm sorry to hear that the, half the group was so uh, unhappy and traumatized. But my, if I may just say that my reason for giving use of such a hard time uh, in paradise was precisely to show the way that uh, children uh, and their well-being was so undervalued by the society to, to which he belonged. Uh, and in order to do so, of course, the young man has to suffer for that to be demonstrated. But uh, at the same time, those who did uh, read and read again, I presume, would have seen that there was a degree of uh, attention and care uh, and tenderness for his feeling, even while he was going through these processes. So it's a way of also describing how people survive such torments and traumas, rather than to say it just goes one dark thing after another. So there may be a chink of light that the, your group missed. <laughs> So we're going to take another round of questions. Um, we were very heavy on this side, so we're going to try, and there's a question there. Yes, actually, I'm so sorry, sir. You were the first, yeah, one hand there, one there, and one at the back. So I'll request you stand so they could see you and locate you faster. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yes, please. Thank you so much. This is terrific. I feel like a voice in the room that's missing for me is the voice of, and I don't expect you to be that voice, but it's a question in case you have any comment on this. It's the voice of teachers in high school and university that are teaching literature and African literature in Africa. Like I would like to, maybe they're in the room. <laughs> I'd like to hear from them. Mm. You know, what are, how are you getting your students to read authors from across the continent? What are the challenges? Who's supporting you? Um, and maybe in a future festival, maybe we need to have a panel of these teachers up here to hear from them. So if anybody has any comments on that, uh, feel free. I'm interested in uh, trying to understand the whole question of identity mm. and integration. Because apart from uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, Abdul Razak Guruna, who was born in Africa and he left this continent when he was pretty a young man. My two sisters were actually born and grew up out there in the West. Oh, Nadifa, you, you are born in Somaliland? Okay, but the question is this. Uh, the, <laughs> we are talking about where is Africa? The assumption is made that we are talking from the point of view of being Africans. And for you to come to that identification, you must have grappled with that question of identity as a person. 
And then there's that element of integration. Because identity, the way I understand it, is not just about where you are born or where your parents came from. Identity would mean even the social strata, your education, your travel. So how do you deal with that question of identity that you you'd be happy to be identified as an African and not as a British, as it were, and write about the British that you live with every day? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Murad. Um, funny enough, actually, uh, I was given a copy of uh, We're All Birds of Uganda um, for my birthday, and I was getting to the end, and I left the, the book in a, in a coffee shop, so I don't know the ending, so don't spoil it for me. <laughs> but actually, uh, whilst I was reading it, and then I read about you afterwards, it was quite interesting, because you wrote about a culture that's quite different in many ways from you, um, you know, overtly, um, and you picked up a lot of the nuances on the South Asian experience, so I assumed that actually you, you had that heritage. So, it's interesting that you were, to cap you were able to capture that so well. And then to the other writers, um, I guess it relates slightly to what the gentleman was asking, but um, when you're writing about Hargeisa and you're writing about Zanzibar or Dar es Salaam or you're writing about wherever you're going to go next, um, how do you kind of uh, how do you attach yourself to a place where you're not living immediately and how do you conduct your research into the characters? if you see what I mean. I'm not saying they're anything less authentic because you're writing from those places, but I'm just like, how do you relate to the places when you're at a distance? Thank you. Thank you so much. We're just going to take those three and then we'll come for the final round, I promise. So we'll begin with a question of identity. It's heavy in the room, you know. I could feel a whole, oh my God, people are clutching their pearls, you know, not knowing how that's going to go. So Nadifa and then Hamza. Um, I was born in Somalia left for Britain at a young age. Um, I'm African uh, as a whole thing, so I'm Muslim. There's lots of different things going on. Um, and I think one thing about identity is it's also imposed on you. Um, people identify you for your sake. They'll tell you what you are. And then it's a question of what do you embrace and what do you take forward and, and take seriously in your life. Um, and I don't think, you know, I, I think I'm getting too old now to care. Um, the everyday life <laughs> is, is about being a good human being and living to your ethics, living to your capabilities um, and whether you're Somali, Ethiopian, Kenyan, whatever you are, that doesn't change. What changes? Um, I'm interested in my, my history, in my family history, in um, the music and all of these things. But I do, I constantly am aware of the fact that it's an accident of birth. And in this time of nationalisms and, and, and bigotries, communal bigotries, I don't feel that these identities are the central things that I define myself as. You know, we are all something and we all have to live ethically and, and do our thing. Um, just to ruffle a bit more feathers, you know, I feel like the question that he tried not to ask, look at me, woman's planning, is that, you know, how do you write about Africa, or being African, when supposedly you spend most of your life I can quickly outside. answer that because I think it connects yeah. to your question, which yeah. is how do you write about a place where you don't live? Yeah. And I think it's actually most writers don't belong fully in one place. That's, that seems to be a key ingredient because it makes you hyper alert to things. When I'm in London, my eyes are kind of closed because everything is so common to me, so typical. But in Kenya, my eyes are open. Um, and I was walking up the hill to this place and um, there was this incredible small bird, emerald colored, um, and I stopped and stared and so did Jose Eduardo. And we were both like, oh my God, what is it, what is it? We would never do that about a bird <laughs> in the places that we live. That's because it's gonna be a pigeon. <laughs> But here, it's exciting. Everything's exciting. And that, that hyper-vigilance and um, interest is what it takes to become a writer, an African writer, whatever kind of writer you are. Hafsa, do you agree? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I echo a lot of things that um, Nadifa said. I think one of the points that um, the gentleman in, in, on that half of the room made was um, how do you define yourself as African and not British? But I don't think that you are a single unitary identity. And you touched on this, but you're multiple identities. And I think, you know, for me at least, Nadifa's at the point where she just doesn't care anymore. But for me, it's a constant journey and it's a constant evolution. And I'm constantly discovering things about myself and learning about new facets of my identity and going back to old parts of my identity and deciding what to discard and what to pick up. And um, yeah, so I, it, it's, a, it's an evolution for me and it's, it's always evolving and it's always changing. And I don't, I don't um, like sort of subscribe to sort of one, you know, I am African, but I am not British or I am not Pakistani, which is, which is my other half. Um, but I also I also agree with with with, um, with what Nadifa said about the fact that you know you don't get a choice in how you are identified. Um, and again, coming back to the question over here, you said, how did you write so authentically about a community that you're not a part of? But how do you know I'm not a part of that community? I I, I am half South Asian, and a lot of people don't know that from looking at me because they look at me and they see that I look African or I look black and. They assume that I don't have any South Asian identity, and they, you know, ascribe a, 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 a black or African or whatever identity to me. So, just I don't know if that was partly what you were saying, but the the, the novel, um, the sort of realities of the communities that I've depicted in the novel from the South Asian perspective, are based on my own personal experiences. They're they're, they're partly anecdotal, you know, stories from my in-laws who are who are Ugandan uh, South Asian, um, but they're also just part of the community that I grew up in. I mean, I grew up in a predominantly South Asian community, um, and, 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 and that's, what, that's what's in there. And I mean, they're Gujarati. I, I didn't grow up in a Gujarati specifically necessarily community, but it, there are so many similarities between, between the two. And actually what I found harder writing about was Uganda, because West Africa and East Africa are not very similar. Um, and you know, this is, uh, this is something I had to do. I, I had to go come to Uganda to write that half of the novel. Like I couldn't, and, and this was one of the questions, how do you write about spaces that you haven't been in? Well, you have to go to them um, because you can't. I mean, I'd written the, the second half of the novel, which is set in Uganda, um, before I'd been to the country. And then I went to the country and then I rewrote the whole second half. So, you know, you, you do have to immerse yourself in the culture and immerse yourself in, in kind of the scene, the scene in front of you and, 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 and write what you have seen, write what you have, um, write what you've, you've absorbed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, if I, was, if I were to write about Nigeria, which is, which is my um, African half, I probably wouldn't have to take myself back to Nigeria to do that because I've been in those spaces multiple times. Um, but for, for Uganda, it was, it was a little bit different. I think I'd be quite curious to hear Mia's perspective on that as well because there could be perceptions, negative and harmful, that you know, your, your, your experience of, of, of being African in Mozambique is a bit far removed from others' everyday reality. You know, how would you respond to identity and being African and what that means when it comes to storytelling? Well, I totally agree with what was said before. Uh, I was born in Mozambique and I lived all my life. I'm, I'm living still now in, in Mozambique. And this doesn't give me any legitimacy to think that I'm more closer to the African reality than, than the other persons that are not living in, in Africa. Because, you know, to write, we, we, we have to, to have this distancy, they create kind of uh, a status of mind that are that that enable us to visit our multiple parts and our multiple identities i think uh, there's no essential identity when we speak about humanity or when we're speaking about literature i love that um there was a question about high school teachers, which I thought was beautiful, but um, I'm going to put Anya and Yvonne on the spot and ask if we're going to have high school teachers next year and hoping that's going to happen. Um, I'm not going to point to where Anya is in the crowd, uh, but she's around here somewhere. You can direct that question to her, but I think it's a very important question because you know it would be great to see where we go with that. I'm going to try and be unlike African governments and keep my promise, you know, for one last round of questions, but I'm just gonna take one question. Thank you very much. I think this is a, this is a very engaging conversation. And I have a question about uh, reimagining uh, 
Africa, recreating Africa. Professor, are there stories still unwritten that compete uh, in, in your mind about uh, reimagining Africa and also to my sisters? What is that journey like? How do, how do we move with the reimagination of Africa? Because, you know, from memories, we go to the future. How does this future look like in the stories in your mind that maybe are not written as of yet? Thank you. Well, the simple answer is that, yes, there are multitudes of stories. There always are. Uh, and it, isn't, it doesn't really matter where you're talking about. That what all, I think what, what makes uh, writing so incredibly interesting for, for the writer is exactly to look again at what we think we know or what has been received or what has been handed down or transmitted. So the possibility of reimagining is always, always present, let alone where there is so much uh, mutual ignorance, um, either as a result of uh, failure to communicate our stories to each other or as a result of the various distortions uh, of narratives about who we are. So you can take whichever angle you want, and there's still multitudes to do. I agree, yes, of course. And not only multitudes of stories that are unwritten now, but every story that's been told could be rewritten. I could look at my first novel, Black Mamba Boy, and not write it from my father's perspective, but write it from his mother's, my grandmother's perspective, and it would be very different from you know, a young woman's journey in East Africa in the early 30s and 40s. So each life can be looked at from these multiple, never-ending perspectives. Um, and I think that that's actually probably, that's the main thing for me that's missing from narratives about Africa or of Africa is this feeling that, okay, you don't just have one story of a child soldier and that's the story of African child soldiers. It's, you can do the same thing again and again and again and again and only increase your limited, it will only ever be a limited understanding of something but um, that value given to one person's life is, for me, the most important thing. Not the big stories, but those individual stories. Um, we're about to come to a close. And <laughs> the final question is to all of you, you know, how do we expand the horizon of what Africa is and what it isn't when it comes to creative writing and storytelling? Um, We'll begin with you. I mean, we've covered a lot of that ground in the conversation so far, but um, I think I think the answer is just to keep 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 reading and keep writing and keep exchanging these stories. I mean, I, I grew up reading I grew up reading African myths and legends. This is a book that we had in our shelf at home that my parents had probably bought in an airport or something and been intrigued by the fact that it said the word African on it and thought, yay, let's buy this. And you know, I much, much later found out that it was written by a, um, a woman called Kathleen Arnott, who's, um, you know, she was a white missionary in, in um, uh, Nigeria. And I, I, I'd, I'd taken these stories as you know, my like African folklore and tales growing up. And then I felt a little bit surprised um, that, you know, su subsequently when I, when I was older and realized that, that it hadn't actually been written by someone who, who was actually telling the traditions of their ancestors. Um, but we need to do more of that. We need to make sure that we keep writing our stories and keep getting them out there and, and keep um, having, them, having them picked up at the airport by, by people like my parents. <laughs> Abdul Raza. Well, I, I, I don't really think I can add very much to that, except mm -hmm. perhaps to say that um, surely that is what has to be done. You have mm -hmm. to keep doing it, you have to keep reading, you have to keep writing, you have to keep uh, refusing uh, certain stories and constantly uh, contesting them. Um, and I guess also amongst ourselves, amongst uh, our communities, we also have to learn to be more tolerant uh, of other stories, of other ways of looking. But, so it, there are many different dimensions, as it were. Both the dimension of just simply uh, proselytizing, saying more, learning more, but also just learning to be less doctrinaire and less narrow-minded 
about uh, the truthfulness, authenticity, or whatever, all of these things. Mm. I love that. Um, Nadif, I'm quite interested in you exploring, expanding on what Africa is not. Uh, no, I don't think there is anything that it's absolutely not. You'll mm. find everything there, mm. here. Mm. Um, but I guess what you're getting at is what we're constantly told it is, yeah. which is war. You know, Quality. being from somewhere like Somalia, um, people come with a lot mm. of um, baggage to that mm. subject and can say really outrageous things to you that make you think when you're writing, I will never want to feed into that mm. um, stereotype. But then that's also inhibiting and it's also placing them at the center of your thought process, which is not what you want to do. I think um, as I get older, uh, I keep talking about getting older, I feel like I'm getting older. Um, Why is she looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel literature should be unruly. It should be beyond um, custom and and control and dictatorship. And if you're constantly you know, fighting the good fight and saying to people, oh no, we're decent people, Somalis are peaceful, blah, 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 um, you, you're not respecting yourself. And I think that writing should be primarily an act of self-love. And whether that's a communal self-love or an individual self-love, sometimes you are opposed to your community and therefore it has to be an individual self-love. But that's what it, for me, should be an exercise of. Mia? Yes? I would I'll love to hear your final thoughts on expanding the horizon about what Africa is and how we yeah, can encourage young writers especially who are in the crowd today to tell different and diverse stories about the continent. I think what we, I would say to young writers is to encourage them to question about um, the so-called reality, the tradition, the unique identity, and uh, about the need of rethinking our own past. I mean, the, this simplistic and ideological portrait that they have, someone has built for us as the Africa, uh, on, uh, the African past. That's thank what you, thank say. you so much. Um, Oftentimes we say that if you spend time trying to counter negative narratives, you actually end up reinforcing them. So sometimes it's better to explore new narratives and new stories. It's been my absolute honor having you today and having conversations with you as panelists. Um, I would love for you to all just stand up and give these amazing panelists a round of applause.